Hello there. My name is Bradley, and this is SumSub, a channel on how to survive in the online jungle. So if you've ever wondered how much of your computer or smartphone's computing power is actually being spent on security, I mean, bear in mind all of the information that we say download from the network or the information that we exchange with another, it's all protected by advanced encryption methods. In an investigation on Cicada 3301, I spoke in detail about the use of classical encryption methods. Now, most of these methods can actually be cracked through simple brute force attacks. Of course, that takes a lot of time when done manually, but with the advent of modern computers, Caesars or Visionaire ciphers are as easy to crack as, say, just a few mathematical puzzles. Well, today we're going to be using fundamentally different algorithms. Complex and repetitive transformations reliably protect themselves from brute force attacks. Encryption keys have turned into huge sequences of numbers. Now, only keys with a size of 128 bits are actually considered reliable. But that doesn't sound very impressive, does it? But in fact, it gives 340 undecillion combinations. It's really impossible to sort them out in a reasonable amount of time. But you know something interesting? Throughout the history of the development of computer technology, we've been consistently faced with the fact that what was impossible yesterday becomes somewhat obsolete tomorrow. Nevertheless, our whole life depends on the reliability of encryption, whether you're talking love correspondence on Facebook to bank payments worth many billions of dollars. So today, I'd like to talk about the real threats to ciphers that we use every single day, and about a fundamentally new security system that you might not have heard of. Sounds pretty cool, quantum cryptography. And I promise in advance, today, no cat will suffer. Well, let's start with the simplest cipher. Do you remember the creation of Gaius Julius Caesar? Well, the great commander simply shifted all of the letters in the message by the same number of characters. For example, when you shift by three letters, something like A turns into D, B into E, and so on, when you're using the alphabet as the key. Now, look at this intercepted message. We don't know how many steps the letters in this message are shifted by, but we do know the principle of the encryption. Suppose the second line is Caesar's signature. In order for I to turn into G, it needs to be shifted by 19 letters. Let's check the following letters and get Gaius. We're not mistaken, and now we can easily decipher the entire message. So translated, Caesar's message reads, I did what I could, may those who are able do better. You see, we didn't have to go through all 26 possible shift options sequentially. If we spent only a minute checking each of them, then we would probably get the right one in almost a quarter of an hour. And so we cracked this cipher in just a minute and a half, all without even knowing the original language of the message itself. Piece of cake, Quill. Now, an interesting question remains. Is it possible to make this cipher more reliable? Yes. For example, you can complicate the key. If we agree that the letters in the message will shift by the number of letters in the key, it will become much more difficult to reveal the cipher itself. So let's encrypt the word Caesar. C is the third letter of the alphabet, so we'll shift it by three characters. A is the first, so we'll add one step, and so on. As a result, we get an incomprehensible Akai. And now let's apply that same principle to the original message. You see, here it's much more difficult to decipher it. And please note that the word Caesar was actually encrypted differently to last time. The changed number of letters before the initials is actually to blame here. Our key is shorter than the message, and we have to write it down again. And again, we have to encode it. The number of letters in the message will change, and the initials themselves will also change. Ideally, if a key has the same length as a message, the cipher will be impossible to find. Each letter will move to its own step without repetitions and patterns. And even knowing the encryption principle won't help at all to crack the code itself. We have an excellent and reliable algorithm. Why don't we just use that? Well, it's all about the key. Now, in order for the recipient of the message to be able to decrypt it, he or she they must have the same key as you. Now, 
In addition, the keys must be changed after each use. Now, if you're often meeting with the addressee, then handing over the keys really isn't a problem. Although, then it's probably easier to just send messages without an encryption in the first place. You can actually act like real spies and stock up on a supply of keys in advance. And this is called a one-time pad. Now, indeed, you will need to meet in a safe space, but just once. And then you will use such a page of such pad to work with codes and immediately destroy it after use. Now that is reliable, but it's inconvenient. The keys run out quickly, so this method only really works for rare communication sessions and small messages. Now in real life, a combined approach tends to be used. The keys are actually much shorter than the text of the message, but the encryption algorithm itself is actually much more complicated. Now, the letters are recorded many times in a row and in quite a complex way. And that's without mentioning that they actually affect the location of one another. Now, many of these operations were extremely problematic to perform, so by the middle of the 20th century, electromechanical encryption machines were widely used. Surely you've heard about the German Enigma more than once. Now, this code was considered uncrackable, but British cryptographers from Bletchley Park still managed to crack it. Now, the Germans themselves were partly to blame here. They made mistakes when using keys, they wrote predictable messages, and so on. But the main thing is that a group of scientists led by Alan Turing managed to create a huge machine that sorted through all possible passwords. You can see here, this is Alan Turing's machine. A three meter cabinet filled with wires, electric motors, and relays. The brain of the machine is 108 rotating drums, which imitated the Enigma encryption disks. This machine was going through several hundred possible combinations every single minute. The disks clicked like the clockwork mechanism of an explosive device, so the machine was actually called the Turing bomb. To cope with the decryption of German messages, it was necessary actually to build 210 of such machines. Pretty impressive. And now look at the screen. You see this spreadsheet? It's about 200 kilobytes. That is probably less than my Facebook profile picture. And at the same time, the table completely replaces both the Enigma and the Turing bomb. Now, think about it. One spreadsheet replaces the entire Turing mechanical computing center. 520 tons of copper and steel we're talking about. The unbreakable code of the Second World War is decoded in the blink of an eye in plain old Excel. Of course, since the time of Turing, new encryption algorithms with secret keys have also appeared. And these obviously have their advantages. They're the fastest and easiest to implement and are quite reliable when using long and random keys. But unfortunately, they're completely unsuitable for a modern network. Just imagine that before making a purchase on Amazon or subscribing to Netflix, you'd have to go through the procedure of obtaining special unique keys. And you'd have to all do it offline, by mail or courier. E-commerce would look very different. And I think Jeff Bezos would not have a chance of being in space. Fortunately, there was a revolution in cryptography in the early 70s. First, a model was created, and then a successful encryption algorithm with a public key. Imagine that you want to send, I don't know, a briefcase by mail, but you want to make it so that nobody can intercept it along the way. I suppose you'd take a strong box and put the briefcase in the box and maybe close it with a padlock. But can you see where the problem is? Well, without a key, the recipient of the parcel will not be able to open the lock. We don't have the key. We can't open whatever it is we don't have that it unlocks. So what purpose would be served in finding whatever need be unlocked, which we don't have, without first having found the key what unlocks it? And if you're afraid to actually send the key with it, what should you do? Well, everything's pretty simple. You send a briefcase with a lock, and you keep the key for yourself. Now, when that briefcase arrives at your friend's house, he will not try to open it, but instead, he will add his own lock onto the briefcase, and he'll then send it back to you. When you receive it, 
you'll remove your lock with your key. And now the briefcase remains locked only by your friend's lock. So you send it back to him, he'll unlock his lock, and then that's done. The case traveled three times, but you managed to ensure reliable transmission of the contents without having any information about each other's keys. Now, obviously this idea is great, but, well, it's pretty mathematically unrealizable. It's impossible to decrypt a message with one key bypassing the second encryption. Unlike the lock on the case, each encryption changes the contents of the package itself. But the story of the briefcase inspired mathematicians and they began to look for an analog of the system with two independent locks. The research resulted in public key encryption systems. Now in such a system, each user creates two keys at once. First, secret one, which will be only used by its owner. And this key is generated based on random set of numbers, right? And then a second key is paired with it, which can be published in open form. Now only one public key can correspond to one private key. And it's easy to calculate the public key, but it's almost impossible to find out the private key from it. And this is somewhat similar to exponentiation. You could probably square 17 in your mind, but you wouldn't be able to swiftly find the square root of 5,832. We've already talked about such algorithms in a series dedicated to cryptocurrencies, so rewatch that if you forgot about it. So now I've got a pair of keys, secret and public. And when someone wants to send me a message, they encrypt the text using a well-known key, but it can only be decrypted with a linked secret key. Returning to the analogy with locks, it's as if I sent a bunch of locks to everyone in the world, right? And they're all opened locks, but they don't have keys. Now, if you want to send me a parcel, simply put one of these public locks on it. Now, no one else will be able to open it apart from me because I have the master key. Now, you use this exact thing hundreds of times every day. Now, every time you visit HTTPS websites, you see that lock on the address bar, right? Perhaps if you're connecting to Wi-Fi or entering a pin code at the payment terminal, you're using it. Now, programs on your computer or smartphone constantly exchange public keys and use them to create secure communication channels. But there is a fundamental problem with this algorithm. To actually generate the keys, the task of decomposing huge numbers into a pair of prime factors is most often used. And for cryptographic tasks, numbers with several hundred characters are used. Now, to quickly sort out the multipliers of such a number, that's an impossible task, even for modern supercomputers, and therein lies the problem. So there's various shortcuts that people found to quickly be able to determine whether something is a prime number, uh, but no one has found a shortcut to be able to find the actual prime factors. Fortunately, we're not talking about only the computers we're familiar with, well, those ones with binary architecture. We are now on the threshold of a new revolution. The appearance of computers based on fundamentally different physical principles. Now I'm talking about quantum computers. This is Peter Shaw, an outstanding American mathematician and also the author of the first algorithm that should demonstrate the supremacy of quantum computers over, say, conventional ones. Now, by a strange coincidence, Shaw's algorithm can actually be used to attack popular public key encryption systems. In 1994, it seemed like science fiction, but already in 2001, the IBM computer was able to decompose the number 15 into its prime factors. Three years ago, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine predicted that a powerful quantum computer would actually be able to crack a 1024-bit encryption key in less than 24 hours. None of our classic computers would actually be able to do this task. Our sun would probably go out before then. Write the prime factorization of 75. Write your answer using exponential notation. Hmm, I have to think about that. Return to this place in exactly seven and a half million years. Such an incredible gap in performance is due to the fact that quantum computers do not sort out solutions, but rather choose them from all possible options. It's kind of like your computer trying to put together a puzzle with existing pieces. Now, computers with binary logic will sequentially iterate through all possible combinations. The quantum computer, on the other hand, already contains all possible combinations of the puzzle elements. We just need to understand which one is right for us. And just with the selection of prime factors, the criteria for this choice are very easy to determine. Now, while there are only a few quantum computers in existence, most of them are generally designed to solve one specific task each. 
But on the other hand, the guys at Google promised to provide commercial access to their quantum monster as early as 2029. Some cybersecurity experts are already discussing a new ideology, post-quantum cryptography. Recently, the first algorithm designed to counteract a quantum supercomputer has already appeared. And it's so symbolic that the authors have called it New Hope. Indeed, quantum computer science, in addition to its related threats, brings new approaches to solving old problems. And one of them is secure key exchange. Now, although the name of this technology again uses the word quantum, it's not related to quantum computers. At the heart of this technology is another concept of quantum mechanics, the fundamental fragility of the photon. Take a look at this ordinary sum sub ball. Regardless of whether I'm looking at it or not in the room at all, this ball will still be lying in exactly the same place. But with elementary particles, everything is not so. For example, a single photon can fly through two different slits at once. It can emit high and low energy at the same time. It can rotate clockwise and counterclockwise at the same time. And before we try to measure these quantities, you need to understand the particle has all of these properties. This cocktail of states is called a superposition. As soon as we perform a measurement, the superposition disappears. The particle goes into one of the probable states. And it's no longer possible to return the particle to the superposition states. And this is an irreversible process, right? It's like bursting a bubble of soap. The very act of trying to measure your position prevents me from measuring your position. And it has have jack shit to do with your consciousness or your mind or your eyes or anything. Now, this is the basis for secure transfer of secret keys. When transmitting ordinary information, a series of short pulses are used, almost like Morse code. When the transmitter is working, it's a one, and when it's not working, it's a zero. Standard binary data. But for quantum transmission, individual photons are actually used, each of which carries much more information. Firstly, a photon can have a horizontal or a vertical polarization and these effectively make up our zeros and ones in our system. And secondly, when transmitting data, you can actually rotate the polarizer at an angle of 45 degrees. And these two positions of the polarizer are called basis. Now, the sender of the secret key will randomly decide to use a straight or diagonal basis before each new character. The receiver of the message will also randomly set the basis before receiving a new photon. According to probability theory, their choice will coincide in half of the cases. The rest of that information will be lost. After the end of the key transfer, the recipient will tell you which bases he used to decrypt the key. The sender will then compare them with their results and tell you which bases were chosen correctly. Now, it's those values that will be the key for future correspondence. Now, this key can be used to transfer data on any open network. But why complicate the system so much? Well, it's a simple answer to exclude the possibility of eavesdropping on messages. Any observer will not be able to determine the state of the photon without actually altering the superposition state. In addition, the spy will have to guess the bases that were chosen by the sender. As a result, if the recipient's error rate increases to something like 75%, well, the key will be considered compromised and it will be transmitted through another channel. What gets interesting with quantum communications is whenever we add an eavesdropper into the mix, I'm going to shift this equipment in here, which is going to simulate an eavesdropper trying to listen in on our conversation. Whenever the sender receives a message, you'll see both lights light up on the detector. What that indicates is that the middle man cannot tell what the sender sent. This algorithm was developed back in the late 1980s, but only in recent years has it gone beyond the laboratories. Now, today, quantum communication lines are being experimented with in Europe and America, and China, well, they launched their first national network this year. 4,600 kilometers of fiber connected about 150 different banks, defense enterprises, and government agencies. The encryption key transfer rate was 47 kilobits per second. And that's quite enough for streaming encryption key changes. In the 20th century, cryptography received the status of a science for the first time. Before the Enigma hacking story, decrypting other people's code was, well, more of an art than an exact science. Alan Turing effectively brought rigorous mathematical methods to the world of cryptography. Assumptions and insights were replaced by methods of mathematical statistics and game theory. 
Now, the volume of transmitted data is growing faster than the computing power of computers and also the bandwidth of networks. And therefore, the problem of optimizing encryption algorithms is becoming more and more serious. In addition, the advent of quantum computers threatens to leave behind usual methods of encryption, such as public keys. Now it's time to think about fundamentally new algorithms of the post-quantum era. And also recommend taking a closer look at the shares of quantum network providers. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's been swell. My name is, of course, Bradley, your reliable guide through the bewildering and wild winds of the worrisome online jungle. I'll see you in the next video. Have a good one.